Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. First, NixCon. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee that they gave me this, uh, the opportunity here to present uh, our work. Uh, Philip uh, didn't make it to the conference, but I think he might actually be online. So this is maybe not your average uh, Nix talk title. It's Nix in a scientific environment, bringing Nix together with computational chemistry. So uh, many people are afraid of chemistry, but fear not, I don't have too many chemistry slides actually. So let's start a little bit with the acknowledgements. Uh, I'm basically a, a professor in, uh, at Stockholm University, uh, leading a research group in chemical physics. So I'm actually not really, my tea is not my main job, and Nix is more or less of a very useful hobby to make our, our work possible. And what you see here is our, my research group in Stockholm. They actually do not really, they're not active Nix, uh, Nixers, but they actually, they actually benefit, benefit all from a very well set up uh, environment that just runs everything smoothly on Nix. Then, of course, uh, special thanks also goes to Philip Saber, Sheep Force, who contributed a lot uh, over the last two years to the effort of making uh, computational chemistry more palatable in Nix. And also special thanks to uh, Christian Kögler, who's in the audience, who actually got me into Nix. And I think without him, I would maybe be sitting here trying to package apps with containers. So I got saved. Um, i show you a little bit intro and background of just to give you an idea from which side I'm coming from. Then a little bit, I talk a little bit about the scientific software infrastructure that is already present in Nix packages and things that we add with our overlay and try to modify. And then uh, I also show you some kind of like anecdotes of things that we have come across over the years. Uh, lessons learned from, from packaging things and all the quirks that, that can appear. I hope there's uh, something useful then for some of you. So what we usually do everyday life, right? We are kind of chemical physics, uh, theoretical chemists. Uh, so we mostly do theory and simulations. So no experiments, but uh, we basically keep computers busy all day long at a, at a large rate. And what I'm particularly doing is like we're doing electronic structure theory, photochemical processes, for example, you know, what happens if you get a sunburn, uh, the chemical process behind those kind of things. We look at uh, manipulation of chemical properties uh, with, with light fields and so on, all those kind of fancy quantum things. We do ultrafast spectroscopy and, and other second physics. So this might not mean much to you if you're not a physicist, but what does it actually come down to when you run your calculations? What's the thing that you do in practice that keeps the computer 99 or 90 percent of the time busy? And in practice, that means you solve some kind of differential equation uh, in quantum mechanics. And in practice, I would say that means uh, two things. So either you stuff things in matrices and you do matrix operations, linear algebra operations, or you do some kind of Fourier transforms. So that's what uh, the main computation time in, in our programs, I would say. The thing uh, relies a lot of, uh, on, on parallel computing, of course, you, so you need to take parallelization into account, large scale parallelization. And to give you a hint a little bit, I mean, I would say uh, in my personal work, uh, we have jobs that are like uh, on the order of maybe 50,000 CPU hours, um, where a single job can, could run that long, for example. Um, some of my colleagues, of course, might laugh at that and say, okay, this is small, but uh, well, you already need a bit, little bit of electricity to get that done, actually. Um, so from, from the background, what are the problems that we're actually facing? So when I started my position four years ago and I said, okay, I have to run my own system um, and I have to set something up that's viable and that's easily maintainable, so, so what are you actually up against when you look at supercomputing centers? or in general at the, at the landscape. So the first thing is like uh, a lot of uh, scientific software package are very special. So they're not necessarily packaged. So that's why you have to do the job yourself if you really want to use it. And those things can be quite quirky, but I have a few examples on that later. 
Then, of course, when every time you talk about uh, high performance computing, that means uh, you have to optimize your code for the machine that you're running on, right? You run a modern CPUs that have a lot of features that needs to be taken into account. Otherwise, this is basically like uh, running a Formula One car in the first gear over the racetrack, if you do that, if you just use maybe everything completely vanilla. Then uh, very common in typical high performance uh, compute centers from university is still so-called environment modules. If you have never have heard of them, consider yourself lucky. It's basically a very fragile way of uh, generate uh, software and custom compiled software environments. And shockingly, this is very often done manually still. I mean, the community is uh, in, the, in the HPC community is moving forward a little bit. It's getting better, but still a lot of things is actually done manually. So every time you update your OS, most of your applications probably break. And uh, yeah, well, how do you run your jobs? You usually have uh, workload managers installed in your cluster like Slurm, PBS, some kind of batch queuing system. You send a, a simple uh, batch script uh, to the workload manager and the workload manager takes care that it actually gets executed somewhere on the cluster. So obvious solution to everyone here in the room, right? Let's use Nix to do all of that. Uh, I mean, out of courtesy, I think I, should, uh, I think I should still be fair and say there's also with Wix, there's a large effort of going on and where people, where this is uh, coming into the scientific So you need to be able to reproduce things this other state, right? If you're an experimentalist, you do an experiment, you have to describe it well enough that someone else can repeat it. We are theorists, so we're doing, we mostly run simulations. So it's basically sitting in front of a computer all day long. And reproducibility means like I stick some input in, could be text files, binary data. I send it through some kind of program or script or whatever, and out comes a result. And that result should be every time uh, should be the same every time you do it. And someone else should also be able to reproduce your stuff. So of course, uh, for the input, I guess you're responsible yourself, but uh, when it comes to the, for the programs, right, you need to, to rebuild your programs in a, in a reproducible manner that you have the same dependency chain with exactly the same versions all the time. Standard problem, I would say. Um, so exactly same software, you start looking into and you can even ask yourself if you need the same hardware to be 100% reproducible in the end but so obvious answer here is that Nix of course is uh, perfect to solve the, the software part of this equation very easily uh, I would consider this almost standard now so let's have a little bit of what's actually already uh, available in Nix packages and just going over like with find over the Nix packages source tree. Uh, surprisingly, biology is very active here in packaging stuff uh, for their domain. Chemistry, a little bit less, but uh, we're working on that. Math, 170 packages, uh, physics, astronomy. You see also some kind of activity here. And of course, uh, what I didn't count is machine learning and data science, since those packages are spread over much more categories in, in mixed packages. So if you talk about then what kind of basic infrastructure in terms of packages does uh, mixed packages provide us? From my perspective, uh, something that you always need is some kind of MPI library. MPI stands for message passing interface, if you've never heard of it. It's a parallelization suit, which is very common in uh, scientific community, uh, BLAS, LARPAC uh, for linear algebra routines. Uh, that's pretty much entangled uh, anywhere. And I, if you look in the Nix store, you probably have a, a BLAS implementation even on your desktop almost. Same fast Fourier transforms, FFTW library. Uh, if you start overriding that, you cannot even reinstall Firefox without recompiling it. And of course, we have like the more modern stuff like GPU computing uh, in, in terms of CUDA and so on, which is already nicely there. So then what uh, we've created a few years ago is the so-called NixOS uh, QCAM overlay for, to bring in more quantum chemistry packages, uh, very specialized domain, of course. 
the name might be a bit misleading. Of course, it's not NixOS specific, but uh, well, I started developing it uh, solely on NixOS and the name kind of stuck. So we use this as an incubator for new packages and uh, well, some packages maybe will have a forever home that they will never get upstream to Nix packages since they are so quirky that I'm actually embarrassed to open a PR for those. Um, well, what we also built into is like optimize for, for modern CPUs so to, that we actually get out the best acceleration that you can potentially uh, get out of a modern system and yeah, and provide basically everything that someone who is a computational chemist actually needs to productively work. Um, this is very closely coupled to Nix packages, of course, so it's not like we only take stuff from Nix packages, a lot of stuff is flowing back to Nix packages once we have, once those things actually have actually been worked out. So this approach with the overlay, we have published that even in a scientific journal, which is very nice because now we can actually go ahead and say, when we did a calculation, we can say we used this and this and this program. And basically, Nix, NixOS QCAM with that hash version, that's how we did it. And then everyone else can basically just take it and reproduce it. Um, yeah, so a little bit structure of the overlay. I think there might be some tricks, uh, tips and tricks in there which are interesting uh, in a more general sense. So what we did, uh, we didn't do that initially and it causes a lot of problem. Actually, all the packages that get introduced by the overlay, they do not just get in the default uh, attribute set, but they actually get into a subset so that you have uh, nice separation and you avoid name collisions. Just imagine you have a package called Mesa. What could possibly go wrong, right? In terms of name collisions. Uh, nothing works anymore in your system. Um, then we have introduced some uh, customization so that you can easily turn on those, those kind of uh, CPU related optimizations and so on to make that a bit more palatable. And what we also do is we take uh, packages from upstream Nix packages and uh, project them into the subset and then apply our, our optimizations for it. Um, also includes tests. Tests are actually super valuable as you all know, but even here, uh, helps a lot to detect problems early when you update stuff. So how does that look like? What we do is like Nix packages has this config parameter and we basically just our inject our config here in qcam minus config as, a, as another subset. And you can then, for example, turn on simple tools like use CUDA, which turns on uh, CUDA and all the packages that support it. Or we have a nice neat trick where you can supply a, a specific internal source URL, which then Require, uh, overrides your require file so that you don't have to load um, all the proprietary packages manually into your next store. And then, for example, here the opt arc where you can uh, pick something that is already defined here in, in lib systems uh, architectures. For example, for AMD of CPUs, you say send one, send two, or something like that to get uh, optimized build inputs. Plus some other uh, convenience things uh, that make it sometimes easier to handle, like injecting license files for proprietary software. So then uh, when we talk about customization, um, let's actually walk back a step and see what's already in Nix packages. So what we have in Nix packages is MPI and MPI comes in three different flavors. This is open MPI, that's the default, most commonly used these days. But you also have something like MPI CH and MV uh, a pitch that you could, uh, in, in principle, use as a as a uh, implementation. Those API, those MPI APs are actually very well standardized, so they should be very well and easily replaceable. So what we did is like the the standard, the default Open MPI maps to M MPI, uh, which then means like if everyone that writes an uh, an expression that uses MPI, you just use the MPI. Uh, attribute uh, to consume that, and then you can simply write an overlay and replace it, for example, with another implementation. And that's an also sometimes useful because here you have different optimizations, maybe for infinibond networks or something like that. Also interesting because uh, with a setup like that, you can very easily, for example, run a Hydra, which we do, and then build all the, the different variants and see uh, how well that actually builds. 
spoiler alert, not everything builds with everything in the end. That's, I think, the, the short message here. Then we can do the same for BLAS and LAPAC. That's also a feature of, uh, of mixed packages already. And I think credits here go to Matthew Bauer, who put that system in. Uh, it's actually uh, quite sophisticated how that gets replaced here. Those are your linear algebra routines, and in most packages, they're really like absolutely crucial to get good performance out of it. So again, you have different implementation like OpenBlast, the open source default here. You have Intel's MKL, Bliss and Flame from AMD, and so on. And it can, in principle, replace that. Uh, again, works then here super easily with an overlay where you just, uh, for example, replace the provider here with MKL. We also built that in different variants on our internal Hydra, and uh, it turns out that's actually a much more complicated problem, and a lot of things actually fail when you start replacing it. So it's an interesting, interesting case study, I would say. Then the CPU optimizations. This is something that we actually have played around with in the overlay, and different ways of how you can potentially do that. And of course, the easiest way is to, in your standard ENV, to basically start replacing uh, compiler flags to get optimizations. Uh, however, if you know, if you replace your standard ends, you get an absolute math rebuild. And if you just want to do that for your scientific software, it might actually be a bit too expensive if you want to really do that. So we opted for the uh, for the intermediate version where we actually only rebuild the packages in the overlay with a with an overridden standard env. And then we can, for example, change host platform and add uh, flags like AVX and so on. Uh, to the standard env and uh, use also some GCC related tuning options uh, to speed things up a little. And this is actually a nice feature, again, already, and already nicely laid out in mixed packages itself, that you have here the host platforms and all the flags that are potentially supported. For example, if you have a package that uh, have a configure flag for, let's say here with AVX in that, in that case, then we can simply add an optional and choose the default here nicely from standard and post platform and you pick the, the flags that you want. Nice advantage is, is of that is if you write it in that way, if you overwrite your standard env with the respective flags here to support the flag to flags in your CPU architecture, your things get automatically built in an optimized way. And that has turned out uh, in practice actually uh, works quite well causes little problems so far in practice and uh, makes things actually uh, really much faster. So the last part of, of this part of the talk, uh, just a little example how we use uh, that in, in practice here. With a workload manager, again, you just send away a shell script and the workload manager takes care of it. So what we use heavily here is basically the shebang fe uh, header uh, feature of the shell. So that's actually then also on the wish list for the new command line interface that we would basically get a replacement for, for that feature. And then you can either use the sloppy version and just define, okay, you want a particular program here, or instead of using minus P, you could also say, I point to a particular mix shell file with pin dependencies or so if you want to run it absolutely clean. So four years of experience and lessons learned from packaging stuff. Um, reproducible tests and results. A lot of uh, numerical packages come with some form of test suit. Right? So then you would say, okay, if I give a, a specific expression with pin dependencies to someone else, it should run exactly the same way, right? Yeah, no. Uh, we, had we had problems where there was actually not the case. So there are certain impurities, um, for example, that Especially OpenBLAS and MKL libraries do that. They have a feature called dynamic CPU detection. So they detect at runtime what platform they're running on and what optimizations they want to turn on. Nice feature, makes it super fast, very easy. But, um, you know, sometimes you use different kind of optimization and there's a bug in a library or something like that. You run it on a different machine, test fails on one machine, test runs on another machine. Absolute nightmare. So, if you want to really get rid of that, you basically would have to turn off the default and compile OpenBLAST, for example, for a specific CPU architecture. Um, and hint, 
for everyone who didn't get the message, never ever use uh, GCC's fast math optimization. Uh, that actually can lead to the fact that you don't even get reproducible results with the same program on the same machine on the same day. Um, only use that if we really don't care about precision or anything like that. So test foods and resource usage. Uh, you know, a lot of programs are run with, uh, they are compiled with OpenMP, which gives you nice, easy threat parallelization. But what does OpenMP do when you don't tell it how many threads to use? Well, it just uses all of your cores, right? So now you have a built machine with 64 cores. They're all blown up. Uh, this advantage is actually that the test cases are usually very small, and they are sometimes actually much faster if you just run them on two threads than on 64. So this can cause massive slowdowns, and I think I have actually seen that in the wild, for example, with a package like NumPy. Uh, to get rid of that, simply set OMP num threads variable to a small number in your install check phase or wherever it applies to get around that problem. Same thing a little bit for MPI. That's even a bit more difficult since there's no real auto detection here. Whenever you have something that actually runs, run it with a fixed number of, of CPUs. Makes the test much more reliable, build faster, and uh, yeah, in general, more reliable. So another interesting thing that we observed are Fortran-specific features. And I don't know, this might not, might, not everyone might be familiar with that with that quirk of Fortran, but Fortran has a default integer size, which is not clearly defined on a 64-bit uh, platform. So it's simply defined by a compiler switch. You tell it, I want my default integer size to be four byte or eight byte. Um, the problem is that your compiler has uh, no means of actually detecting what a dependency was compiled with, which leads to the fact that you can have a mismatch between your app and your library. It compiles just fine and then simply crashes at runtime. So also very important message, especially in those cases with Blas and LARPAC, test things, run tests, uh, see if, if your binary actually runs and halfway does what it's supposed to do. With um, this kind of uh, nice setup in Nix packages for Blas and LARPAC, we have this like is ILP 64 flex now basically in the in the wrappers in there, which is a super nice feature because then you can simply add some asserts uh, in your expressions and make sure it's actually set to what you want it to set. And then it's actually that the dependencies have the right, uh, the right integer size. Because of the fact that uh, you know some scientific software packages they're, they're old they maybe have their roots in the 80s scientists are not uh, computer scientists usually but physicists or chemists so things can end up a little bit quirky and then not always built in the, in the most standard way so a lot of things comes from broken CMake CMake not used in a way it was supposed to be used uh, total nightmare interactive installers which uh, basically ask you uh, in which part is your library, which, which compiler flex do you need to get the library built and so on and so forth. Um, the next thing we had like was uh, very well intended probably by the, um, by the developers. You have a program that had comes with a shell script, it builds, it installs itself automatically into a home directory and asserts to um, or, of course, pinning dependencies the non nix way. You start downloading things or checking or checking out Git repositories during build time. Doesn't play well with the Nix uh, sandbox, um, of course. I think Wild West of build systems, the only advice here from that is like be creative patching that kind of stuff out of your, of your build systems. Uh, there's, there's probably no other way if you actually need those quirky packages to work. Uh, Nix packages pinning. I mean, of course, we support flakes, but uh, we think we even went a little bit further and said we always pin or overlay to a certain Nix packages version uh, because otherwise things break way, way, way too easily. And we have a little bit of a, of a hack here that we actually make use of uh, flake lock, uh, even if you're not using flakes. 
might be a dirty hack, but uh, works works quite well in practice actually to keep things stable, at least as long as the format of Blake lock doesn't change. Yeah, okay, that's already at the end here, like summaries. I have to say, last four years has served me well. We use it in production in Stockholm uh, and uh, in Jena. We have our own small cluster running with it, uh, productive use every day. Updates are actually pretty much always easy. You can keep old versions. Uh, things are super smooth. Uh, little breakage, little headaches. Um, yeah. Now we actually have really, from a scientific perspective, we can uh, share certain environments very easily uh, by pinning simply to some Git hashes and sharing that one somewhere else, which makes it super citable also, which is important for us. Some things may be difficult to package, but not impossible. I think there are only a few things that we actually gave up on. And I think for our community, this, this is almost a complete uh, toolkit by now. And yeah, of course, contributions even to the overlay, they're, they're always welcome. So Outlook, uh, what's important in the future, what we didn't have addressed so far, benchmarking. Benchmarking uh, how long did a test run on Hydra? Uh, much more complex than that. So there needs a lot to be done there. Then what's not integrated whatsoever are window-based compilers, compilers like the Intel compiler and D compilers. A lot of people depend on that. And of course, uh, the outreach part here again, uh, if you want to use it on, on supercomputing centers where you don't have root access, you have to kind of convince administrator there, administrators there to install Nix for you. Yeah, and that's, I'm at the end. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for two questions and I already see hands. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to the one I saw first. Yeah. Hi, so are you able to uh, build your packages uh, with any other compiler than uh, GCC? Um, yeah, in principle, it should be easy to override your, your compiler, like for example, with, uh, with LLVM or something like that, right? Um, but I haven't tried that. So we have, we have experimented with different versions of the libraries, but not with different compiler versions. Okay, thank you. Um, so I really appreciate you breaking, bringing this topic in. I can barely contain my excitement. Um, so the short version of my question is we should talk afterwards. Uh, but for the benefit of the audience, first a comment. If you have username spaces enabled and like shared storage or something, then you don't need uh, root access to have Nix because you yeah. can just use it like that. Um, I don't know if that, that works for you. That is true. I haven't tried that. Since so, if you have everything running on NixOS, you're so comfortable that you don't yeah. even want to go somewhere else anymore. But um, it depends on, I guess, what the setup on a computing system is, because some yes. setups are actually like very conservative with very old kernel versions. Yeah. So, so maybe that's worth something looking into. Yeah. And um, my actual question is, a medium-sized legacy uh, university cluster at some point. And the team members don't know Nix, I know Nix, and we, we aren't looking to use Nix on the system because of course users need familiarity, the administrators need familiarity, but I'm constantly keeping it in mind to see if I can maybe push this into the system at some point, maybe in parallel with the usual tooling. And the question is, uh, are you familiar with, have you looked into like existing tooling for HPC systems like Singularity, SPAC, the American uh, HPC clusters seem to have a lot of infrastructure that looks pretty good for, for mm. packaging things that, of course, isn't Nix. Uh, but like the important part here is you really need user buy-in. Uh, so we're, we're going to be doing this mainly for uh, medical and um, genetics applications. Like, do, do you have any insight on this? Well, I haven't, uh, SPEC, I haven't used personally myself, <clears throat> so I have no experience with that. The Singularity Containers, you can They did with several nodes or something like that. Things actually need a lot of hacking to get it even working at all. 
So singularity, as hyped as it is sometimes, I wouldn't recommend it on a larger scale. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.